Welcome to the WRAL Daily Download. I'm your host, Ali Ingersoll. The tenets of journalism are truth, accuracy, and objectivity. In our role, we hold people like elected officials accountable, and one way to do that is to fact-check their statements. WRAL's PolitiFact reporter Paul Spey is here to talk about that process and the importance of fact-checking, especially as we enter an election season. Hey, Paul, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Of course. So first, let's start with what is PolitiFact? All right. It's a national, nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit group that uh, started uh, about 15 years ago at the ta- what's now known as the Tampa Bay Times in Florida. Uh, the founder, Bill Adair, uh, was covering uh, presidential speeches uh, on, and other speeches on the election trail and saying, you know, he saw something missing. You know, uh, most traditional media stories, they uh, they talk about an issue, they give you the Republican side, and they give you the Democratic side, and they let you decide what's true and what's false. And so he saw a space where uh, reporters could find a claim that stands out as uh, interesting. It doesn't even have to be false, just interesting on the campaign trail, something that someone's campaigning on, and to look into it and grade it on a scale from true uh, to mostly true, half true, mostly false, false, or pants on fire, Mm -hmm. which is typically reserved uh, for statements that are not only false, but uh, sort of absurd and ridiculous, something that the speaker should know is false. Mm. Uh, So we've been around a while, uh, still based in Tampa, but there are state bureaus around the country, including here in North Carolina. That's us here at WRAL. Mm -hmm. You just kind of touched on this. So you are our uh, PolitiFact reporter, but not the only PolitiFact reporter. And it takes a lot of work from this larger group to check all of the information. So can you walk us through what exactly that process looks like to check these statements? One thing about our process that I love is that it's the same every time. Everyone gets the same treatment. Uh, And so when we hear a claim uh, that deserves a fact check, the first thing we do is reach out to the person who made it. And so if that's a politician, if that's a bureaucrat or whatever, uh, we send their spokesperson or their office an email or call them and say, hey, you said this. Where are you getting that information from? Uh, and, and or can you back it up? What, what proof do you have? Uh, and then we start uh, step two of the process, which is looking for uh, the information ourselves, whether it's Googling or looking into archives, whatever it takes, really. Um, but we always use credible sources, whether it's the CDC or, you know, the Library of Congress, if you're looking for old records of things. Uh, we don't take someone's word for what's in, say, a bill. We go to the bill and read it ourselves. And if there's any gray area about what it may or may not mean, we uh, talk to the bill sponsor, you know, the person who wrote it up, and then we talk to legal experts. So uh, that's step two. Uh, and then after we gather all this information, the reporter writes it up. Uh, based on what he or she has gathered or they have gathered and uh, takes it to an editor. In this case, that would be my editor, Jack Hagel, here at WRAL. Uh, And then after that's done, uh, three editors assemble for what's called a star chamber. And it's very (laughs) magical. And it's where these editors come together. They read my drafted story and they all uh, essentially decide uh, what rating does this deserve? Mm-hmm. Um, and your fact checks vary from the national level. Uh, we have seen a lot of the presidential ones to a very localized one. And I guess that's because we are the bureau here in North Carolina, right? So who decides exactly what to check or like when the red flags are going off about maybe we should look into this? And are there any sort of challenges when it comes to looking at something that's really hyper local? Yes, um, there's... <laughs> You could almost throw a, a rock in any direction and hit a statement that merits some clarification because, you know, politics is so fast and furious. Politicians make claims that are usually um, abbreviated. You know, that a lot of times they talk as if you know what they're talking about already. They leave out lots of context. And so, uh, you know, you, 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 we could fact check everyone every day almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we do have to be uh, wise with how we spend our time and resources. And so... Come election time, uh, like this year in 2024, uh, uh, we generally go for the statements that people have heard before that will have impact. You know, so uh, when President Trump, former President Trump was here in Greensboro just a couple weeks ago, uh, he said that 82 percent 
of uh, Americans believe the 2020 election was rigged. That was the first time our team, not only here at WRL, but at PolitiFact had heard him say something like that. And that's significant because um, if that statement is true, then uh, obviously he would have a lot of support, a a lot of wind at his back taking him back to the White House, right? But it's Mm -hmm. not true. We fact-checked that claim about the election being rigged time and time again. It's been debunked by not only our team, but other fact checkers, by the courts, by uh, judges who he appointed and even, you know, dismissed by former Attorney General uh, Bill Barr. So uh, that that was obviously curious to us and it merited a fact check uh, in part because it was important, but secondly, because it qualified. We can look up, okay, he said there's a poll out there somewhere where uh, – that reported 82% uh, belief in that the 2020 election was rigged. I'm I'm saying that very disjointedly, but you mm-hmm. you get what I'm saying. And so we Google around and look for it. Like what, what where is this credible poll he's talking about that says mm-hmm. 82% uh, of Americans believe it was rigged? And it's not out there. We discovered it's not out there. What likely happened is that he saw a headline about Fox News viewers. There is one. There's one, I believe it was in Newsweek's, uh, Newsweek, excuse me, that said 82% of Republicans who mostly rely on Fox News believe the election was rigged. So mm. uh, we n- never really judge people's motives, right? So we're not going to come out and say like, oh, he's lying or he's intentionally uh, you know, misrepresenting this. But we can tell you that uh, it's, it's not correct. That one survey that he may have seen with the number 82 in it mm-hmm. does not support his claim that 82 per- percent of Americans believe the election was rigged. Yeah, because he's missing that qualifier there, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. At the end of every segment you do, you reference the truth o meter um, and it ranges from true to pants on fire. So how is that rating decided? You kind of touched on that a little bit, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. And like how much of a statement has to be true or false for it to land somewhere on that meter? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, uh, most of the statements that we check here at WRAL, we we pick out because they can be rated. They qualify for a rating. Um, and one thing that's disqualified from a rating is claims about the future. We can't check the future. So uh, for the most part, unless it's a bill, you know, if someone introduces a bill and the bill, you know, we, we can look at what a bill intends to do. Mm-hmm. But we can't really look at things like, oh, you know, if if we uh, don't elect – Donald Trump this year, then by 2023 or by 2030, excuse me, you know, 10 years from now, uh, the country will be, you know, in the dumpster. Like we can't (laughs) check things like that. Um, And so we mostly look for claims that are superlative, like, you know, a bill is the most or the worst or the least or, you know, if they have a number in them, those things uh, really lend themselves well to fact checks. Uh, And then the ratings, uh, obviously true. Uh, you don't see very often, but it does it, it does happen every once in a while. That's where someone said something. It was accurate. No extra context needed. Mostly true is where something is is true based on available data, but there might be it, the data may not be up to date, you know, or there's some context missing there. Uh, but, you know, uh, evidence suggests this person is likely correct. Half true is where there's like uh, – Something about what they said is true, but there's lots of context missing, you know, where you someone may have made a claim about uh, immigration numbers that were true back in 2020, but as of now, they're, they're not up to date, right? These are uh, off-the-cuff examples I'm mm-hmm. giving. Uh, and then there's mostly false, uh, and that's where there's like a kernel of truth where someone says something that's based in truth, but the general idea and picture of what they said and how they framed it is – misleading or inaccurate. Obviously false, there's nothing correct about what they said, and then pants on fire, uh, I mentioned a minute ago, uh, generally not only false, but sort of absurd where the speaker should have known what they were saying was inaccurate. We're going to talk more about fact-checking in general when we come back from this break. All right. Welcome back. So, Paul, you've held a number of roles in journalism. And even here at WRL, you work with our NC Capital team. You do some political reporting for us. What is it about fact checking that you enjoy and why do you feel like this is so important? Well, it's important because uh, 
as Bill Adair mentioned when he founded PolitiFact and what he says uh, on the road is that people need a roadmap to the truth, right? And so um, it's important in that we try to provide people with the best available facts. Now, both sides are going to talk about issues and they're going to mention uh, different details related to those issues, but we're going to try to provide the clearest picture of uh, what someone said and whether it's true or not. Um, and what's great about it, uh, from my point of view, is uh, a lot of it is uh, founded in curiosity. Like if someone says something, oftentimes I'm covering a politician or a, I'm at a press conference, something like that, and they say something, and I'm like, huh, that's, I haven't heard that. That's, not, that's new to our, uh, our discourse. That's, I haven't heard that on the campaign trail or anything. A, a good example would be uh, I was at the Capitol – uh, about a month ago, uh, maybe more than that, when uh, Congresswoman Deborah Ross, who represents Raleigh, was there introducing a bill uh, to try to uh, bring more transparency to the redistricting process. So she's talking about that. And then at the end of her press conference, she says, hey, uh, reporters, remember to tell your viewers and readers to go vote. We have the longest voting period in the country. And I thought, huh, that's, I've never heard that. You would think that would be something that's like at the bottom of North Carolina State Board of Election emails or like mm -hmm. I, I, I'm shocked that in uh, I, I've covered North Carolina since 2010 when I first became an intern at the News and Observer uh, and I've never heard something like that. And so uh, fast forward, you know, I reached out to uh, people that track that sort of thing and uh, obviously our own State Board of Elections and other states. Turned out it was true for general elections, but not true for primary elections. So it's, it's things like that. You never know when you'll uh, hear someone making a big, bold claim or uh, just hear something that is would be an interesting factoid about your state. You really need to have your finger on the pulse of state politics, but really just keeping your ear out. And I think that's so unique to this job that you do, right? So you need to be listening to these press conferences. And while you're not covering their day-to-day -day movements or anything, you're covering what they're saying. And if little, like, your flag, like red flags go up or something, that's, that's, right. that's when you're like, hey, I got to get to work here. Yeah. So is the election season, is that busier for you then? Absolutely. It almost seems like, uh, it, it sometimes seems like, uh, it's feast or famine as a fact checker. <laughs> There's either nothing going on, you know, uh, back in uh, 2023 and off year, uh, or everything's going on. And there's people emailing us and there's sending us ideas on Twitter through our portal here at WREL um, or on TV with ads. And we have to really, like I said earlier, um, decide how best to use our time. All right. Now, this one I was really excited to ask you. So are there any memorable PolitiFacts that you've done and what are they and what kind of makes them memorable for you? Oh, my gosh. Uh, there's one in particular. Um, I don't even know if I should say this one. Um, when I was in my first year or so at WREL, uh, we were fact checking uh, someone who was running for U.S. Senate and uh, they were about to get a false rating and um, the candidates campaign sort of detected it wasn't going to go well for them and they decided out of nowhere they were going to call up the ladder here mm -hmm. at WRAL and they called our boss this is before Jack was here they called our boss Ashley Talley they went above her I'm, I'm told they went all the way up they tried to get to the owners of this very news station I don't know if they ever did mm. um, but that was memorable uh, just because of how hard someone, uh, how much effort they took to try to stop a fact check. Um, and that was about uh, whether or not a candidate took um, uh, money from corporate uh, PACs, political action committees. And uh, the gist is, you know, a lot of candidates say, well, we don't take corporate PAC money. We don't take corporate PAC. That means they don't take money from, say, you know, a, a, a political action committee that gets its funding from, say, oil executives or mm -hmm. whatever. It can be any industry. Well, there are, all, there are packs out there that will uh, sort of uh, launder the, the funds and then give it to uh, candidates. So mm -hmm. like, okay, you didn't take money directly from the oil executive pack, but they gave it to an intermediary, intermediary who then gave you some money. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, you know, it, it's fair to say you don't take you know, like you're not uh, taking money from the specific 
oil executive pack, but you don't know that you're not taking that that oil money because you're getting it from this middleman. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's a tangent. Um, And they were really upset with uh, how we ruled uh, and explained um, how that all works in our fact check. And then the other one that stands out, there was a guy, this was years ago, and I forget the details, but uh, he had said something about uh, toll roads around Charlotte. This was back when I was at the News and Observer. And uh, on the campaign trail, that was different than what he said when he, was, when he held office. So he had flip-flopped. And we approached his uh, uh, campaign and, and, and you know, with this information and said, hey, you said this this year and you said this, you're saying this now looks like a change in position. Uh, and we have a flip a at the at uh, PolitiFact where we judge how how much a person has uh, flip flopped on an issue. Mm. You know, you can go from in, from no flip to half flip to full flop. Mm. Right. And on a, <laughs> I'll never forget this. Um, I won't say who it was, but someone who represented this candidate calls me and he said, we would much rather have a false just don't give us a flip-flop don't Mm. don't say we're flip-flopping and i thought that was fascinating that uh it's become so accepted in politics today for candidates to misrepresent the truth to Mm. to bend the truth and lie and uh provide falsehoods but flip-flopping is considered this like cardinal sin where Mm. you don't want uh anyone to change their position you want uh, you know whether it's you know, on on the Democratic side or the Republican side, you know, you want a staunch liberal or a staunch conservative who's been that way forever where you don't have to worry about them changing their position. Um, so I, th- those two stand out. That is really interesting and really interesting insight. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. And thank you for listening to the WRAL Daily Download. If you listen to this podcast on WRAL.com or the WRAL News app, you can also find it in Apple's podcasts, Spotify, anywhere that you listen to podcasts, really. Follow the show so you don't miss an episode. Thanks for listening.